It's uh, noon on Friday. Hi, Shear. Hi, Francesco, and hello, everybody. Yeah, we're going to wait a couple seconds and let people trickle in, and we're following us from home. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to start a program. Just yeah. For maybe 30 seconds or so. Everybody's coming in. Good. So maybe um, I can just welcome you all to Zooming In, our weekly curatorial conversations from the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life. I'm Shil Gal Kuchavi, Assistant Curator, and joining me, our fearless Francesco Spagnolo, head good curator. Hi, Francesco. Yeah. Always good to see you. Every Friday we get a chance to chat and to yeah. explore the Magnus collection, more, more or less one object at the time, although today may be a few photographs at the time. Absolutely. Um, just as a reminder for everybody, this is a Zoom webinar, which means that participants' videos are hidden. But if you have any technical questions for us, you can use the chat button on the bottom of your screen. You can also use that button if you would like to let us know where you're, where you're Zooming in from uh, today. And please feel Feel free to use the Q&A button on the bottom of the screen as well for any questions that you might have for us. Uh, we're going to, to have a conversation for approximately 20 minutes or so, and we'll leave a few minutes at the end for any of your questions. So hopefully we'll be able to answer as many as possible. Uh, just as a quick reminder, the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life is one of the largest Jewish museum collections in the world, one of the top three in the United States, and the only one associated with a major research university. Today. Yeah, you know, before we talk about what we're talking about, let's mm -hmm. also acknowledge the fact that we have a new collaborator in our. That's right. Calls, and uh, welcome, he, Ross. Yeah, Ross Coulter, <laughs> and he's not, he's invisible, but very much there, and he's managing the Zoom call and uh, the chat and QA. So, Thank you, Ross, for being with us. Uh, Ross is an undergraduate at UC Berkeley, and it's a pleasure to have him on board. And now, yes, sure, we are talking about... We'll be talking about uh, Beyond the Photo Archive, Reconstructing the Concerns of Roman Vishniak, a 1971 exhibition at the Magnus Collection. This is an exhibition uh, called... Um, um, I apologize. Um, an archive, of today. Archives. an archive of archives and we opened that exhibition right before the pandemic uh started uh this and last uh spring unfortunately the magnus is currently closed but we're hoping that soon we'll be able to reopen hopefully in 2021 which is coming up and then you'll be able to visit us and see and see this beautiful exhibition for yourselves yeah. uh we'll concentrate on two main themes today the Roman, the Roman Vishniak archive at the Magnus, a gift that was uh, that was given to the Magnus in 2018, and the archive, an archive of archives, the exhibition, and an exhibition history that is part of the archive, which we'll get into in a few minutes. So, Francesco, would you like to lead us into our beautiful, the beautiful gift that we received in 2018? Yes, just a few words. This has been discussed in the press and. Uh... Uh, we have some videos out, etc. So we, you know, the story has been told, but let's just remind everybody how Mara Vishniak Kohn, the, the daughter of uh, Roman Vishniak, donated the entire Roman Vishniak archive. We're talking about roughly 30,000 images between negatives and slides and of course prints like the ones we're seeing on the uh, I, I think we're, we're fond of showing Albert Einstein in his office at Princeton. <laughs> this is after Roman Vishniak arrived to, to, to the United York. States uh, in, in 19 and, uh, and settled in New York. And one of his photographs, while he was, uh, while he was uh, photographing uh, Jews in Eastern Europe, which is what Roman Vishniak, who was uh, born in 1897, died in 1990, uh, is most well known for. Um, uh, he was also taking photos of storks and writing copiously about storks. He was fascinated by the by the, the way in which storks fly and all the mechanics of it. Because in a way, and, and so he was also a great photographer for for uh, for uh, taking portraits of Albert Einstein. He was really a 19th century intellectual. He he sort of looked at humans with a scientific gaze and and had a very uh, humanistic eye for for the sciences. So uh, it's an archive that mixed in sort of in all kinds of ways. We see here uh, reading children in Eastern Europe and in America. Um, 
maybe the American ones are a little more bored and less <laughs> engaged than the, uh, than the than the than the East European uh, children uh, uh, portrait in nineteen in Cheder in the in the in the traditional uh, East European uh, Jewish school uh, in uh, in nineteen thirty eight in in what is today's Ukraine and of course the archive contains no, about two thousand prints and lots of negatives and slides of uh, Vishnik's incredible uh, scientific work which. Uh, uh, is still being uh, uncovered and studied. We have colleagues across the country and beyond who are studying these, these materials. We're also collaborating in, on, on our campus with the Center for the History of, uh, of Science, Medicine, and Society. So we have good historians who are assisting us in understanding Vizhnik's scientific work. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, the archive is full of incredible surprises. Just recently, Cher, we were contacted by the was it the yes. granddaughter of the woman? The granddaughter. So, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, so, so Rama Vizhniak, when he settled in New York, his wife had a, had, had a business in Chinatown. So he went to Chinatown and, and took incredible images of Chinatown, very extensive documentation. And we're little by little reconstructing, reconstructing this work. And, um, and, uh, and then, of course, uh, part of the, of the archive, Sneak just peek. for giving you a, a yeah, a general sense, and we'll be releasing some of these images soon. They're about to finish processing. But uh, Israel in color, uh, a, a, a batch of hundreds of images taken in the summer of 1967 when Roman Vishnu traveled to Israel, was based in Jerusalem, traveled around the country, and Jerusalem was torn by the by the 1967 to 6 day war. So it was a it was a very pivotal time, and and as you can see, top left and top right, improvised street signs in Hebrew, giving the direction and and, and uh, also a lot of photos of uh, street vendors, Arab street vendors, street life, like in a way similar eye to the one that he applied to, to, to Eastern Europe. And that makes us think that uh, um, beyond combining this sort of humanistic and scientific uh, outlook, he was also always constantly interested in a variety of disenfranchised uh, communities around the world, whether, whether it was Jews in Eastern Europe or or others in America or Israel and beyond. Uh, we have a little video, a little snippet of a video, and uh, those of you from home may want to, uh, to uh, turn up the volume a little bit. Mara Vishnia Kohn, uh, towards the end of his very long and, and fruitful life, uh, uh, gave us a few words about her hopes for this, uh, for this archive, that we continue to study research and document while, in, while, on, while sheltering in place. And, um, and um, and so let's hear from Mara what, uh, what her hopes were just before the archive was donated at the end of 2018 uh, to the Here we go. at UC Berkeley. My goals for the collection, which is to keep the work alive and also in a way keep uh, the people from dying again. And uh, that means we don't want uh, involved. Uh, both as photography uh, and uh, possibly with the experience of my Jewish family. So um, to find uh, a place that kind of sparkles with activity uh, and involves young people is uh, just uh, almost the fulfillment of a, uh, I hesitate to say a dream, but that comes to mind. So and the, these were the beautiful words of Mara Kohn Vishniak. Uh, and we're hoping soon to be able to really re-invite all the students who have been working with us. And luckily, a lot of them have continued working with us throughout the semester digitally. So as Francesca said, we'll hopefully be able to make a lot of materials available for some of you to even uh, view from home. Uh, an archive of archives, our new exhibition, and a part of a long history of exhibitions by uh, organized by different organizations for uh, Roman Vishniak's unique and, and 
and interesting and incredible photographs uh, was an exhibition that we opened at the Magnus and here it is uh, just, just a few months ago. And uh, Francesca, would you be interested in walking us through it? And I'll join you in a few, in a minute in, in, in introducing a bit of what we know of the history of the exhibitions of Roman Vishnia. Absolutely. Well, so here are just a few slides that document uh, what is left of an exhibition that, as you said, Roman Vishnik presented in, in New York. It was a collaboration with, a, with, uh, 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 with Cornel Kappa, and, uh, and it was about the, the, the overarching theme of concerned photography, hence the title, The Concerns of Roman Vizniak. But it's also a, an important exhibition. So essentially what we were, were trying to do, and we will continue doing once we reopen to the public, is, is show how the Roman Vizniak archive is uh, in a way a container of many other archives. And it allows us to reconstruct the exhibition history of Roman Vizniak. And in the case of this exhibition, again, 1970, 1971, 72, those are the years in which it was conceived and presented. Uh, this is an exhibition that really helped framing uh, the future of uh, Vizniak's legacy. And especially as we will see in the course of this presentation, the, the literal framing of the images for his publication project about a decade later, A Vanished World. So it's, it's an important uh, transitional moment. It was also an exhibition, it was designed as we see, uh, it was designed, it was uh, in, installed on panels and traveled across the United States and made Roman Vizniak a household name, especially among the, the Jewish communities in, in North America. Uh, but it was preceded, and so this is just an example of the other archives within the archive by other exhibitions. These are um, the original boards uh, of uh, two exhibitions that Vizniak presented in 1944 and 1945 at YIVO, the Yiddish uh, Research Institute in New York. Very precious to us. It's, uh, these are materials that are fresh to him and, and his information is, is crisper in terms of describing the locations, the places and, and so on. So it's a, it's a great resource and we'll be exploring that. And this was the, 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 the catalog that accompanied, copy of the catalog that accompanied the concerns of Roman Vizniak that also had, we should say, an important uh, um, uh, science component audio, uh, in audiovisual, which has not been preserved uh, for us. So we'll, we're reconstructing. We are, as we are, time. absolutely. And it's so important for us to have these materials, uh, the ones that we are able to, to learn from the archive directly, and also the ones that we're able to obtain from other sources around us and from other libraries because it allows us to really look and understand how the artist's work has been strategically presented and viewed by the public, how this exhibition, uh, The Concerns of Roman Vishniak, we're discussing here, that was first presented at the Jewish Museum uh, in New York in 1971 and continued traveling through um, the United States and, and visited the other Jewish communities really contributed to make Roman Vishniak a household name uh, in the United States and in Jewish communities. And, and we, across. we have a video with uh, we do uh, with uh, with him. It's sort of like a gallery tour that that is uh, <laughs> been preserved by our colleagues at the libraries in of South Carolina, University of South Carolina. And so we're presenting a few minutes of, of Roman Vishniak being interviewed in the context of the original installation at the Jewish Museum in New York. So we're 1971, 1972. Uh, this is, by the way, the exhibition that is mentioned in Susan Sontag's uh, in, important work on photography. She, that's how Susan Sontag knew about this. It, it really, it, it catapulted Vizniak in a, in a different league. So let's watch it. Oops, I'm sorry. Hello. I it was good. There we go. It was good to see the rest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello, I'm Gregory Jackson for Directions here in the Jewish Museum in New York. Roman Wisniak has been called one of the few true Renaissance men of our time. A microbiologist, a lecturer, a writer, an expert on Oriental art, a collector of medieval manuscripts, and of course, a photographer. In fact, internationally known as one of the most perceptive photographers of our time. Speaking of his extraordinary work in microphotography, for example, one critic put it simply when he said, Vizniak makes the invisible visible. And we'll see some of that work later. But in those terrible days just before Hitler struck, the Jews in Eastern Europe, the ghettos there, were also somewhat invisible. And Dr. Vizniak was there with his camera. It was difficult 
because according to the scripture, the Jews didn't want it to be photographed. I had to use a hidden camera. And then certainly the police didn't want me to photograph poverty and to show discrimination and all the anti-Semitism. And I was called once to the police quarter and they told me, if I will take the picture that they know I want to take, I will be never able to leave Poland. But in spite of this, we got these pictures. And I lost many. I took maybe 16,000 and 13,000 were taken away and destroyed. But I saved still 3,000 pictures so that we see how the life was in so-called normal time. Naturally, the time was never normal. It was always a very hard time. It is strange. I took the pictures 35 years ago, but when I see them again, I am as excited as I was at this time, because I knew that the danger that all these people will be killed was something that paralyzed me. And I remember all details. I remember the smell, and I remember what was to the right and to the left of the position I stood, and what I told to the people, and what did they answer me, and everything seems this moment, this moment, the moment is still alive with me. You've been a photographer for a long time when you did this? No, I was an amateur, That means I was extremely interested to get a better picture. And only when I arrived into this country in 1941 to make a living, I couldn't speak English. I could make only pictures, the only communication. And I took portraits at first uh, Russians, and then they recommended me to others and you don't need to speak English to take pictures. Well, back in the uh, ghettos of Eastern Europe then, uh, when you were taking uh, these pictures, did you ever get caught? Were you ever arrested? I was arrested 11 times. I was immediately thrown into the prison, and this means you stay there as long as they forget you, and they usually do it, especially if you are very deep, if you don't have a window, no daylight, if you are in complete darkness day and night, that slows you down. But it didn't slow me down. Well, what kind of evidence would they use? Uh, what, what did they charge you with? Oh, they always could prove that I was a spy. They developed always my picture. They used for it a paper developer that spoiled naturally the picture. And then they found the machine. I was protesting. It is a swing machine. It is an American swing machine. Where is the spy? It is a machine. And only spies are photographing machines. Dr. Vizniak, aside from the politicians and the police, even the Jews themselves, those you were photographing, objected to it. How did you do this? I worked always with hidden camera, both with still and with movie hidden camera. I used for this purpose a Rolleflex. A Rolleflex was under my coat with the lens looking through an opening. And I was focusing always with the feeling here is the infinity and here is the extreme close up of one meter. And here are three meters, seven meters. And with the Leica, I just took the Leica into a handkerchief. It was a hot day, for example. Picture. This is the Leica now in your, the camera Leica itself hidden in the... in the handkerchief. Because I must look into the Leica when I take, I don't need to look on the ground glass of the roller flag. So I just make one movement, picture, down. 
So nobody can see that I took the picture, just only with one movement. I took by the same And here I think we can we can let Roman <laughs> continue speaking and, and uh, show some of the some of the, of the images that we presented and, and how we how we studied them. Uh, so we're we're kind of connecting uh, the layout that we saw in the in the galleries of the Jewish Museum. Uh, some some here, well, here on your left, um, yeah, yeah, on the left uh, with uh, the corresponding negatives from the from the archive. Uh, so you see on, on the, the center, center, you see a, a, a negative, and on the right you see how the image was then printed in the publication. Of, a vanished world about a decade after the, the exhibition itself. So, and what one sees is really in, in, in doing this type of comparative work, how this exhibition was a graphic, a photographic, a pictorial staging ground for what became the, the volume of vanished world that then launched uh, Vizhniak's name in a, on a global scale. The, the book was translated in many languages and it was published all over the world and continues to be an important uh, volume on which we are also, of course, working. So let's look at a couple of other examples of this. Um, here is another example. Uh, once again, we uh, have the, the image uh, that is currently hanging on, on the wall of our gallery and in 1971 was presented as part of the Concerns of Roman, of Roman Vishnu exhibition. And in the center, we added once again the, uh, an image of the negative in our collection. And then on the bottom right, you see the image from a vanished world from the publication. It's really a snapshot of, of the book. It is, it's up. not so perfect. It's yeah, a it's, bit. it's a little bent. Uh, it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be straight, supposed but to be it's perfect. a full page. <laughs> but what we notice, yeah. well, what we notice is the fact that in, in both the exhibition and the book, many of the negatives were cropped. And as we will see also- Cleaned as uh, well. Cleaned and, 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 and the light was brought out. In yeah, the, this is a great example for that. Um, yeah. And, and here we see how the same locales, this was a, a, a school, a rabbinical school uh, uh, mm -hmm. in, in Munkach. Uh, we see it in the, in the exhibition of Eagle in, in the 1940s, in this exhibition 1970s. It's, a, it's the same area, but different photographs. And then we see the, the story of this photograph in, I think in the next slide, we see again the yes. negative, yeah. uh, much more somber than, yeah, than in the, the final product uh, uh, in, uh, in the exhibition. And then on the right in the vanished world. And this goes carries all the way into the the image that became the cover of the book. Mm -hmm, and so let's let's find that because we opened our exhibition with essentially with that photograph for all the obvious reasons. We have the the, the negative on the right, and we see it's a more expanded view of this uh, very intimate uh, scene. Uh, but then this is a photograph that had its own an image that had its own history and ended up, as we see in the next slide on the cover of The Vanished World that was published in 1983, and then there was a, another edition in 84. And, and, uh, and, and in a way, this is where our story sort mm -hmm. of begins. But in order to begin our story, we have to go back and research all these exhibitions and how, how they were presented. And it's a double research in a sense. On the one hand, there is the research itself where we use the, the existing documentation, the negatives, the slides, et cetera. And then there's also, of course, the books and the written materials that we keep reading and looking into. And luckily, some members of the family who are wonderful in helping Absolutely. us. Absolutely, we have incredible resources. And uh, even though we're, you know, on lockdown, and here it is, that's at the beginning of our installation, our beloved uh, Magnus collection of Jewish art and life in downtown Berkeley that will hopefully soon reoccupy and revitalize with the presence of our staff and our students. Uh, let's see if we have any any questions from, uh, uh, from, uh, um, from uh, people at home. Yeah, you we'd can, like to you encourage can use you. The Q and A button. So if you mm -hmm. if you click on the Q and A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, at this point everybody from home is a pro. Is a Zoom pro. <laughs> <laughs> at <laughs> least our viewers. <laughs> uh, we wanted to kind of share with you what what was the the behind the scenes and the kind of thinking that we did uh, that we did uh, in order to put this. Like, exhibition together and present it to the public. Uh, and actually, before we start with the first question, uh, since I know that you'll all be rushing off to enjoy your weekend in a few minutes, I just wanted to invite you to join us next week for a completely different presentation called Old Craft New Media, where uh, we'll have a wonderful guest, the artist uh, Gabriela Vimens, uh, who will be talking about her work inspired by the Betzalel exhibition that we had at the Magnus last year and a project called Leaning Towers, uh, which is a series of works 
so hopefully you'll be able to join us uh, next week for that. And let's get back to our questions. Yes, so let's see. Well, first of all, a technical question. If, uh, um, if uh, are we able to, to work on, on the premises? And uh, we were trying to explain that. And we're actually now mostly, some of us are, are going on, on premises, but we can't do collaborative work yet. And so our students are very much engaged in a digital way. They're helping uh, research, doing image research and, uh, and uh, inventory work. And we have a fantastic team in place and we're really grateful for their, and they all were returning students from, from last year. And then we had some new arrivals. So some people, as I say, contract the Magnus bug and want to keep working with us for several years, which is really, really amazing. Um, yeah. and, I, uh, do, I yeah. do think it's important to um, encourage uh, all of our guests today, our listeners, and, and those who will hopefully listen in the future, to, um, to log on to our website here on the bottom uh, right of the screen and search our collections because we have made a group of items from the archive already available, including a lot of the materials from the EVO exhibitions of 1944 and 45. So if you are interested, you're welcome to, to enjoy the research that's already available, um, which is really part of the, the few blessings of this time and the, avail the availability of, of digital work. So magnus.berkeley.edu on the screen. And of course, any additional questions, you can email us at magnus at, at berkeley.edu. Uh, we're mostly being thanked from, uh, from people at home. Um, and uh, they, some, some uh, viewers are seem to be enjoying uh, why, why we, uh, how, how we, uh, we went back to the negatives, but that's exactly what we're trying to do and really exactly. we can practice this uh, this collection and, and turn it into into an archive and uh, somebody's reminding us of course there was a, a wonderful the, 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 the writer says good it was actually a wonderful exhibition at the at the contemporary jewish museum it was actually a traveling exhibition mm -hmm. uh, that uh, that also has an amazing companion mm -hmm. book roman dish rediscovered and we're huge fans of that work uh, that precedes our art so you know we we're standing on the shoulders of giants uh, what, what can i say and uh, and uh, I think we had a another um, uh, uh, well. People seem to be moved by the fact that they could hear uh, Roman Vishnet's words in person. Absolutely, and and there's a, there's so much to unpack there. So much complexity in what mm -hmm. he says, and uh, and so we're working on that as well. But we're really uh, focusing on the on the image material. Uh, uh, right now, a question from Sweden. I'm interested in how Roman Vishnik brought his negatives from Europe to the United States. We're not talking about it today because our, our, our conversation is, uh, is, uh, is uh, concluded pretty much. We just have a couple more minutes, but we will of course address this and also the, the, the companion catalog of the exhibition Roman Vishnik rediscovered addresses this and the incredible story of how he was able to salvage many, but not all of the negatives and some of the prints too and, and bring them to and few of the videos with the video recordings and so. yeah and uh, and uh, uh, and a few of the video uh, footage and uh, i think because questions are, of course are coming in from from different uh, directions and q a and chat <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, and uh, so let me just see i think there was one that uh, why did people not want to be photographed superstition uh, I think um, probably a variety of agendas, but uh, it's a very good question. It's a question that gets us thinking, I, I, I believe. Yeah, um, Roman Vishniak does explain it's a superstition in that video that we saw. That's what he, arg what he argues, but I'm sure, you know, reality is even more complex than Absolutely. he tells us. <laughs> and of course, there's and, the question of what day of the week he chose yeah. to photograph. Um, if Could it was we Shema. see some more images with your commentary? Yes, you can. Actually, if yes. you go on the Magnus website, you will find a video that was, uh, you can search for it, search Roman Vizhnik at magnus.berkeley.eu, a video I recorded with uh, our colleague, the historian John Ephraim from UC Berkeley with commentary about these images. And we'll come back to this. And uh, many contributions, people are of course ex excited um, uh, about hearing about Roman Vizhnik. We'll present more in the coming months. We are, we're really organizing uh, the archive and, and trying to deliver it in as much a uh, speedy way as possible to everyone at home, since we have this captive audience at home. Um, I heard that some photographers, not sure Vizhnik, somebody is writing, were sent to photograph the Jewish world in order to show that the community in Europe needed help. That was exactly Vizhnik's agenda. So exactly. thank you for pointing, bringing this up. 
again, today we're not really investigating, and then we're almost out of time. We did not investigate mm -hmm. the history of the of the initial photo shoot, but we're just suggesting that by investigating the archive itself, we can open up new dimensions, new territories, and and then go back in time and try and reconstruct what Virginia did, saw, heard, as you said, smelled in uh, in Central Europe, but also in New York City and uh, in Chinatown, as you said, and in various parts of, of Manhattan and Brooklyn. So there, there is a lot more that we will explore in the coming days. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you for joining for, us today. For your work today and, and for facilitating next week a conversation with Gabriela Vilens, a former student at UC Berkeley. We're looking Having forward her. to it. Uh, and thank you, Ross, well, uh, before we end. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Ross Coulter, who's assisting us behind the scenes. And, um, and um, we hope and, to see you next uh, week. Yeah, we'll see you next week. So we Have a good weekend. After that. That, Absolutely. Et Except for the week of Thanksgiving. We will not be zooming in on Friday of the week of Thanksgiving. Thanks. So see you next week. Sure. See you soon. And goodbye to everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Bye bye.